In this video, we're going to look at how we can link uh, Gibbs free energy with the equilibrium constant. So in the previous video, especially in the video where we talked about and introduced free energy, we said that free energy was a measure of a couple of different things. It tells us, um, one, if a reaction is spontaneous, depending on the sign. Two, if work can be done by the system or needs to be done on the system. And then three, we it gave us a qualitative measure of whether there will be a preference for products or reactants. So we had said that, um, you know, uh, with negative delta G, uh, we would have a preference for the forward reaction, and that would lead to a preponderance of products. And if we had a positive delta G, we would have a preference for the, the reverse direction and a preponderance of the uh, reactants in the, in the equilibrium mixture. So, um, that sort of just recaps what delta G is, but there's a relationship between delta G and the uh, equilibrium constant, and that is delta G is equal to, and this is delta G, the standard delta G, so delta G naught is equal to minus RT times ln of K, where R is the gas constant 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, T is the temperature in Kelvin, and K is the equilibrium constant that we know and love from chapter 14. So another way of writing this, it would be um, K is equal to E to the minus delta G over RT. So that's another way of writing that exact same expression. So what we can say is, um, you know, when... Or, or so what we can do is we can, we can say for this, let's say delta G and we have the sign. So if we have uh, positive, negative and zero, um, then, and when we say positive, this generally means greater than 10 kilojoules. This would generally be less than 10 kilojoules. And this zero isn't just absolute, absolutely zero, but this represents between negative 10 and 10 kilojoules, right? So this, this kind of gives some ranges, right? Um, for areas where we would expect to see these things. So um, if K is a big positive, we're going to expect that it's, uh, so this is the reaction direction we'll put here in, the, in this table. Um, so this is, gonna, this is gonna prefer the reverse. And in terms of the concentrations, we're gonna have um, products is gonna be, I'm sorry, this is gonna be, um, let me just erase that. It's the opposite. We're going to have a lot more reactants than we're going to have products because this is not spontaneous. So the reverse reaction is spontaneous. So we're going to prefer the reverse. Um, if we have a negative delta G, we're going to prefer the forward reaction. And therefore, we're going to have more products than reactants. And if we're at zero, then we're going to get an, we have sort of, a, there's a, no preference is what you could say. And we're going to get a relatively equal mixture. And that can be thought of as equilibrium, right? So, so if you have a very, very large positive, every reaction, no matter what the sign of delta G, is going to form some kind of equilibrium. The thing is, is like with like combustion, for example, the, equi the equilibrium is so far weighted to the products because the delta Gs are so negative that in essence, you don't really have an equilibrium because you have almost all, like 99.999999% products and just a teeny little bit of reactants that were left over. Um, so that's what we're saying with these large positive and negative values. What, what these are basically saying is that they're, not, that they're not really at equilibrium because the mixtures are so slanted towards either the products or the reactants that we don't consider it an equilibrium. But in the middle here, where we kind of have this sweet spot, we would get an equilibrium mixture because then we have relatively similar amounts of re reactants and products. And if it were zero, we should have equal amounts of reactants and products. Okay, so what about reactions that are not at equilibrium? This is actually gonna become important in the next chapter where we talk about electrochemistry. So we can substitute Q for K. Because remember, if we have a non-equilibrium mixture, we can use the reaction quotient Q. 
um, and we can get the following. So if we reorganize this, uh, we can say that, well, delta G naught um, plus RT ln K is equal to zero, right? So if we, if we take this and move this over um, to the other side, if we take uh, minus RT ln K, add that to both sides, we get delta G naught plus RT ln K equals zero. So this must be true at equilibrium. So if we're at equilibrium, those two terms will add together to give zero. If we're not at equilibrium, then what we get is delta G naught plus RT ln Q, because now we're not at equilibrium. This is not going to equal zero. This is going to equal something else called just delta G, um, where this is delta G at a given temperature and ratio of Q. So this will allow us to estimate where we are relative to equilibrium. So um, you can use the sign of this, either positive or negative, to figure out whether we're going to go in the forward direction or in the negative direction based on the Q, which is the, um, the concentration of the reactants and the products that we have um, at, that particular at that particular moment, not necessarily equilibrium, and at a given T, which is any temperature, um, that you want to plug in. And then you can see, well, will this thing go forward or reverse at those conditions? Um, so that, that's the introduction to that. In this, uh, in this problem, we're going to use the equation that we just looked at, uh, where delta G is equal to minus RT ln K to come up with a equilibrium constant for a reaction. So the problem says calculate the value of the equilibrium constant K for the following reactions at 25 degrees Celsius using the data in table 18.2. So when you're using delta G is equal to minus RT ln K, you really have two choices. You can either use the delta G naught of a reaction is equal to the delta G of formation of the products minus the reactants. So um, you have that option, or you can use delta G naught of reaction is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So in this case, this particular problem is going to ask us to use the delta G naught of formation um, pr way of going about this. But keep in mind that there is another way of doing it, and both are perfectly uh, valid ways, depending on the data that you're given. So... Um, this says using the data in table 18.2, which is the delta G naught of formation. So we're going to look up those values. And now we notice that uh, the delta G naught of formation for silver, which is a solid, so this is an element in its standard state, that's going to be zero. And the same thing for chlorine, because that's an element in its standard state. So we get zero kilojoules and zero kilojoules per mole for those. And then the one that we have to be concerned with is for the silver chloride, which is minus 109.8 kilojoules per mole. So um, we're going to set this up where we use our equation, delta G naught of the reaction is going to equal the products minus the reactants. And in this case, it turns out that it's only the products that matter. So it's going to be 2 times 109.8 kilojoules per mole minus 0 which is from the thing. So we get a delta G naught of reaction equal to um, negative 219.6 kilojoules. Now to get this to work with um, the next equation, we're going to have to multiply this by 1,000 to get it into units of joules. Let me show you why. So now at this point, we have two options for which equation we want to use. We can use, they're the, they're the same equation. We can use delta G is equal to minus RT ln K. Or you can use K is equal to E to the minus EA over, I'm sorry, not EA, delta G naught over RT. So it's your choice of which one you want to use. In this case, we'll use the K uh, equation. So we have K is going to equal E to the minus negative 219.6. And I'm going to multiply this by 1,000 to get it into joules, because when we divide this, we're going to be dividing this by 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. So we have to get the units of joules and joules to match. 
So I multiply that by a thousand to get that to match. You can do proper scientific notation if you want, doesn't matter. I just multiplied this by 10 to the third, which gives the, the still the right units. And then the temperature is going to be 298 Kelvin. So because these are at standard conditions, it's 25 degrees Celsius. So we add 273.15 to that to give us 298 Kelvin. So when you do the math out, you get a K equal to 3.12 times 10 to the 38th for our equilibrium constant. So this is definitely going to be spontaneous, um, and it's going to highly favor the products. And if you look, we started with a negative value for delta G, and we get a very large positive value for K, which makes sense because something so a negative delta G tells us that this thing is spontaneous, and it's really spontaneous. It's much greater than uh, ne it's much less than negative ten kilojoules. So it's not surprising that we get a very, very large equilibrium constant. Now let's look at one where we have a equilibrium that we know is more along the lines of an equilibrium. We just saw this in chapter 17. Uh, silver chloride goes to silver plus plus Cl minus, and this thing is going to have a KSP, and usually the KSPs are around 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 10, they, and they can be lower than that, 10 to the minus 30, it depends. So let's see an example of one where this is more along the lines of an equilibrium that we would that we're kind of familiar with. So if you go to table 18.2 and you look up the values, you get minus 109.8 kilojoules for the delta H, the delta G of formation for the AGCl. The silver ion is 77.12 kilojoules per mole, and the chloride ion is minus 131.3 kilojoules per mole. So if we do our delta G of reaction, we're going to get uh, in brackets 77.12 kilojoules per mole plus negative 131.3 kilojoules per mole for our products. And we're going to subtract away the reactants, which is minus negative 109.8 kilojoules per mole. And so we get a delta G naught equal to 55.6 kilojoules per mole. So if we plug this into K is equal to E to the minus delta G over RT, which you can do, you're going to get a K value that's equal to, uh, just give me one second, I gotta look it up, 1.78 times 10 to the minus 10. Um, and now let's kind of compare and look at this concept question down at the bottom. So how does the sign and value of delta G relate to K? So in this bottom one, we saw that we have a positive sign, which we plug into here, and we get a, a K that's less than zero. So this is non-spontaneous, and we see we get a K that favors reactants, which makes sense. So let's look at this concept question. So when we get a delta G that's negative, we get a, a K that's much greater than uh, one. So this thing is gonna really favor products. And when we get a delta G that's um, ne uh, positive, which is non-spontaneous, we get a K that's much less than one, meaning it's gonna favor the reactants. Now, one thing I like to point out too, is if you look, these differences in delta G, the 55.6 and the 219.6, they're only a factor of about four different, you know, um, in terms of magnitude. So uh, you multiply 55 times four and you get about 220. Um, but yet, if you look at the equilibrium values, one is times 10 to the 38th and one is times 10 to the minus 10. So um, because of the logarithmic effect of all of this, there's a much, much bigger impact of um, so even though the change in delta G is relatively small, there's a much, much bigger impact on K. So relatively small changes in delta G will lead to relatively large changes in the relative amounts of products and reactants.